This is Novel Marketing, the show for novelists who aren't necessarily fond of marketing, but still want to become best-selling authors. Episode 143. I'm James L. Rubart, but you can call me Jim. I'm Thomas Umstead Jr. And in this episode, we're going to talk about four specific fundamentals that you need to know about author advertising. But before we jump into that, Thomas, I had the chance to listen to a podcast where you were interviewed recently. Uh, We had Karen Ball on the show, um, brilliant Karen Ball, and she's got a podcast called Right from the Deep with her partner, Aaron Young. And you were on there talking about haters and how do you deal with trolls? And what I found really fascinating, and I don't want to give anything away because I hope hopefully people will go there and listen, but you did just such a good job at saying, you know what? Some of the trolls I had to listen to because they had some things maybe I needed to hear. And you talk a lot about the fact that you had this viral blog post that absolutely went nuts and you had a lot of people hating on you. So anyway, you did a great job and and let's put a link in the show notes where people can go and and listen to you. Yeah, I've, I've received more feedback of this guest podcast that I did on the Right From The Deep podcast uh, than any other podcast I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> so uh, it, my mom shared it on Facebook and like friends from like ages ago were like, I listened to you on that podcast. It was really good. Is that <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. that's cool. And people were reaching out uh, from deep in my past. It was very healing. It was really good. Um, if you have dealt with haters or negative reviews, uh, I think I hope this podcast episode will really help you. Uh, Karen Ball and Aaron Taylor Young's podcast, Right from the Deep, is all about like the emotional side of writing and how to deal with the emotional aspect of it. It's a really fascinating take on a podcast. Um, I hadn't listened to it when we had Karen on the show, and I've now gone back and listened to it, and it's uh, a surprisingly good uh, podcast on a topic you wouldn't think you'd need a podcast on, but you're like, this is really like useful because so much of writing is emotional, and like if you're dealing with fear it really makes it harder, right? Like you are your own worst enemy sometimes when it comes to writing and their podcast is all about that. And so anyway, shout out to them. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Uh, Jim and I are happy to come on your podcast. If you have a podcast about writing uh, or marketing, we, uh, we'd love to come on the show. <laughs> so anyway, this episode, I will jump into the tips real quick. Real quick, the sponsor is My Book Table. Um, is a way to quickly and easily build an online bookstore on your WordPress website. I use it to rank number one on Google for your book and boost your book sales on sites like Amazon and Barnes & Noble. You can get it free at mybooktable.com and our patrons all of them at any level save 25 percent if you get the professional version wait a minute hold on everybody 25 (laughs) percent the cross promotion with our patreon so uh two dollar level of patron of patronage will get will save you 25 percent on my book table pro you can find out more at mybooktable.com okay so thomas we're going to talk to folks about four fundamental aspects of author advertising and For those of you who are new to the program, the way Thomas and I look at it is marketing is an umbrella over a lot of different aspects. One of those aspects or one of those tree trunks, we'll call it, is advertising. So let's get into those specifics, Thomas. What do people need to know? Just some very basic stuff. What do they need to know about advertising their books? So this, these, what we're about to share with you applies to all kinds of advertising, whether it's Amazon ads, Facebook ads, Goodreads ads, BookBub ads. This is, these are the fundamentals that cross apply. So this is like the super basics of advertising. And the first basic is to have a good book. (laughs) So, uh, now I, I don't mean necessarily a well-written book. Uh, when I say good book, I mean a book that has what we would say in the business world has good product market fit. It's the kind of book that people want to buy. Because remember, they buy your book before they know how good it is. And so it needs to make the right kind of promise. And the first way that you do that is with an excellent book cover. Jim? Yeah. uh, This whole idea that, well, we shouldn't judge people. We shouldn't judge the book by the cover, but we do. We do it with people and we certainly do it with books. And what has happened in this day and age of technology is a book cover, people still look at book covers as if they're going to hold the book in their hand. And so a lot of times, if you're trying to do your own book cover, you'll come up with a book that cover, if you have a graphic design bent, you might come up with a great looking book cover if it's the size of the books we grew up with. However, Now we look at books as thumbnails. That's just one aspect of book design that you have to take into consideration. And that's why Thomas and I are huge fans, unless you have years and years and years of graphic design experience. 
please hire somebody that knows what they're doing. I just had my three book covers done for my indie books just redone. And I have some graphic design in my background, but I thought, nope, I I am not going to try to do this. And if you want to get in depth on this, we have two episodes, episode 106 and 107 that talk in depth about working with a designer, what you want for your cover, et cetera, et cetera. But first thing is get an excellent cover. And the TLDR of those two episodes, which you really should listen to because they're very good. Uh, But the TLDR is that your book cover needs to say to the reader, this book is like a book that you already like. And so if somebody loves it, so the key with a good book cover is that it's similar enough to books that people already love that they're like, oh, I know that this is the kind of book I'm going to like. Because if it's too different, if it's too foreign, people will just skim right past it to the next book. So there are times to be unique and creative and innovative. You can do that with your writing. Don't do it with your book cover. (laughs) Uh, That's a high risk move that you um, really, I would say, need to be traditionally published and have a like a professional who's done thousands of book covers to pull off that kind of maneuver. It's very, very hard to do it well. And if you do it poorly, it can totally sabotage your sales. Yep. Yep. Cover is always the starting point. That's right. Uh, So let's turn the book around. The second aspect of having a good book is to have good back cover copy. You need to be able to describe your book and why someone should want to read it in about one paragraph, maybe two if you're lucky. Uh, That is a real art. That back cover copy is the blurb that appears on Amazon after you've gotten someone's attention with the cover. They scroll down or they flip the book over on the back and they read a paragraph or two about your book and they make a decision about whether or not to read your book. And this is the most important writing you will ever do, or the most important writing you will hire somebody else to do for you. Jim, what's the, how do you do good back cover copy? Cause I know you do this professionally. I do. Yeah, I do this professionally. And, and when Thomas has a paragraph, it's like, you got 150, maybe 170 words to sell this book. And if, if having an excellent cover is uh, on a scale of 10 is a 10, having excellent back cover copy is 9.9, right? It's that close. Those two things in, in, in combination are, are just absolutely critical to selling your book because If the back cover copy is strong, what happens? They will turn and go, oh, I better look inside. And on Amazon, you know, you click the button and you can read a little bit of the starting point. If that back cover copy is not compelling, they're never going to click and look at the inside of the book. So, um, yeah, hire me or hire somebody else. Hire somebody to do back cover copy unless it's something you've done for years and years and years. And we have an episode on that, too, where we go in depth about how to design great or how to write great back cover copy, or even if you're not going to write it yourself, if you are going to hire somebody, at least you'll know and be able to work with them. You'll have a better understanding of what goes into great back cover copy. And the TLDR of that, uh, because there's a lot more than we can teach in this kind of summary episode, but the too long didn't read of back cover copy is make people curious. Yeah. You can't give away too much, but you also can't give away too little. You need to find that hook, that thing that makes somebody curious to know what happens next. And that is the art of a back cover copy. And we talked more about that in episode 111. So novelmarketing.com slash 111. All right. The next aspect of having a good book is lots of reviews. It doesn't matter as much how good your reviews are. Amazon reviews are almost always positive. Uh, it's the more important is the number of reviews. If you can get to triple digits of reviews, that makes your advertising so much more effective. And the reason why having a good book is important, we should have, I should have explained this at the beginning, is that if you drive a lot of people to your book page and your book page doesn't convince them to buy the book, it makes your advertising more expensive. So let me explain. Let's say 10% of people who visit your book page go on and buy your book. And if you're paying 10 cents a click to get people to that book page and 10% of them go on to buy the book, you do the math, that's $1 of cost per reader gained. So as long as you're making more than a dollar per copy that you sell, you're making money on your ads. If your conversion rate, though, drops to 50 uh, to 5 percent, the cost to acquire a reader doubles from 5 percent to or sorry, from one dollar per reader gained to two dollars per reader gained. And so this has a huge impact across the board when it comes to your 
uh, sales and your the, uh, whether or not advertising will work for you. So a lot of people are like, oh, advertising didn't work for my book. The problem actually wasn't how they were doing the advertising. The problem was that their book page wasn't compelling enough. There was either a problem with the cover or a problem with the back cover copy or a problem with the reviews. And so you want to have lots of good reviews. And we'll have an episode on this soon on how to get more reviews. So stay tuned. Just make sure to subscribe if you're just listening to this episode. We'll, we'll talk about this soon. But uh, the number of reviews is really important. And then the final thing I would say about the book is that it needs to be priced correctly. And specifically, you need to have the budget for acquiring the reader baked into the price of the book. Sometimes it makes sense to raise the price of the book a dollar or two to have money to acquire the reader. So that gives you a lot more money for advertising than to have your price book priced as low as possible. A lot of authors think, oh, I just price my book as low as possible, 99 cents or 299. And that's the way to get the most sales. And sometimes pricing it higher and spending that extra money on advertising is actually actually the better strategy, especially for nonfiction, but even for fiction. I think that uh, authors are too much in a race to the bottom. And I think a better uh, approach is to raise that price a little bit. And then if you really want to go after the low price readers, you know, get on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, but you need to have a cost of customer acquisition, cost of reader acquisition baked into the price of the book so that you can continue to sell it on an ongoing basis. Okay. So point number one to recap, have a good book, meaning excellent cover excellent back cover copy, lots of reviews, and then budget in to the cost of your book, what you will be taking out of each book to apply to your advertising. So now let's talk about the second aspect of uh, effective author advertising, and that is measure. And there's three parts of this. The first one is measure. The second one is measure. And the third one is measure, <laughs> measure, measure, measure. It is so important to measure location, your advertising. Location, location. Yeah, the only thing that matters. Uh, and if you're not tracking where your money is going, you have no idea if you're getting a return on your investment. So if you spend $100 on advertising your book, are you selling $100 worth of books? Are you selling $100 worth of profit per book? Because you don't get every dollar you know, Amazon takes a cut and others take a cut. Uh, and so you need to measure. And there's specific things you need to measure. The first is that what's called cost of reader acquisition. And this you can use not just on your advertising, but on your entire marketing budget. So now for this category two, you have to be indie published. If you're not the publisher of the book, you do not have the access to the data to do your own measurement. This is one of the big advantages that indies have over traditionally published authors. Really, the publisher should be the one paying for the advertising. So if you're traditionally published, um, it's your publisher who should be spending this money because they're the only ones who can measure. And we did a whole episode on that. <laughs> so uh, you shouldn't be spending much money on advertising if you're traditionally published or any really. Uh, so the first thing to measure is cost of reader acquisition. And you take the total number of dollars you've spent and you divide it by the total number of books you've sold. So if you spend $1,000 on, on advertising and you sell 500 copies of your book, your cost of reader acquisition is $2 per reader. Uh, that should be pr pretty straightforward. We'll have the mathematical formulas in the show notes. So just scroll down. All of these you can do with a four function calculator. So I know this is math, but it's not complicated math. <laughs> and part of being a, an author means sometimes you have to do things that are a little uncomfortable. And this is math. You're, and if you're having trouble, just get your fourth grader with her calculator uh, and she'll help you. <laughs> this is not complicated. Um, it's very, very simple. All right. So let's talk about the th second thing you should measure. And this is what's called the sell through rate. This is the number of people who buy book one who go on to buy book two. There's different ways of calculating this, but the easiest, simplest way to do it is to just take book two sales by unit, not by dollar. So the number of books sold and divide it by the a number of book one sales. And this gives you your sell through rate. It'll give you presumably some number lower, uh, lower than uh, one. So if the, it comes out to 0.8, you have an 80% sell through rate, which means 80% of people who buy book one go on to buy book two. And this is very valuable because let's say you make $2 a book selling book one, and uh, it costs you $2 per reader to acquire a reader. Well, if you have a good sell-through rate, you can still make money overall. And that's where the next metric comes through, which is the lifetime value of a reader. So the lifetime value of the reader is how much money you make off of a reader total. So if you acquire a reader on book one of a series, and you have, say you have three books of a series, uh, how much money do you make? So to calculate this, you take the cost of reader acquisition and you subtract book one's profit. 
uh, mine, and then you also subtract the profit from book two. <laughs> so, uh, and that should give you a um, positive number. So that's the lifetime value of a reader. And oh, by the way, you have to also multiply, this is the most complicated formula, and I apologize, but I have it in the show notes. The book two's profit times the sell-through rate. So this is kind of the, all of the different metrics together. And that sell-through rate, uh, so it, let's say you make $2 on book one, and you, so you have 80% sell-through rate, and you make $2 on book two, that would mean it's um, $2 for book one, and then $1.60 for book two. And uh, that gives you the lifetime value of the reader. And then the final uh, metric to me measure is return on investment, which is just profit divided by investment. <laughs> so, uh, so profit is ex uh, revenue minus expenses, and then you divide that by your investment. That gives you your return on investment. And you want your return on investment ideally to be positive. <laughs> so you're actually making money uh, when you spend money. I realize that this is complicated. This is part of advertising. If you're not willing to measure, um, then you really shouldn't be spending money on advertising because it's so easy to throw your money away and not realize that you're throwing your money away. One nice thing about Amazon ads is that it does a lot of this calculation for you or versions of this uh, because they know exactly how many units you've sold and they'll tell you. Uh, now you have to adapt them a little bit because Amazon assumes that you make every dollar. <laughs> so Amazon's very happy for you to spend a dollar to then sell your book for a dollar uh, and they'll make that look pro profitable. You'll have to then on your own, subtract out Amazon's cut, whether it's 30% or 70%. Okay. So a lot of this was a lot of information, a lot of formulas in a very short period of time. That's why we encourage you to go to the show notes. This will make sense when you see it in black and white, but take the time to do this because this is so fundamental. So many authors say, well, I tried advertising. It didn't work. And a lot of times it's because they did not understand these basic formulas that Thomas just gave out. I'm a huge fan of the show Shark Tank because I think it is indicative of, of the publishing world in so many ways. And if you've ever watched the show, one of the questions that Cuban, Mark Cuban asks a lot, what's your cost of customer acquisition? And most of the time, the entrepreneurs will say, well, it's this and this and this, and we're doing this and this and this. Sometimes somebody will say, well, I'm not exactly, oh my gosh, you don't know those numbers. I, I don't have anything to do with you. And so it is a fundamental of business to know because once you know it, then you can figure out where I spend my money, where I shouldn't spend my money. It's, it's valuable for you to take the time to learn this. All right. The third uh, aspect is always be experimenting or rather just experiment. Once you get something that works, you know, if it's you can maybe slow down your experiment. But uh, the key with advertising, one of the really fun aspects is that you can test different aspects of your advertising. So you can create two different ads that appear on Facebook or two different ads that appear on Amazon that appear to the same group of people. And you can see which version of the ad gets more clicks. You can also do this with your back cover copy. You can test uh, the, which version of your back cover copy performs better. And you can even do this with book covers. So if you buy Amazon ads for your books, uh, for your book cover, you can test different book covers and see which book cover gets the most clicks. And I will say, I did this myself. So I launched my new podcast, Create a Funding Show, and I broke my own rules and I designed my own logo. <laughs> and a friend of mine who's a graphic designer is like, oh, Thomas, uh, I can do better. And she designed some logos. And you know what? I didn't like her logos as much because I didn't make them. I was biased. But I've been in the business long enough to know that I was biased. So instead of saying, I'm going to go with my logo anyway, what I did was I bought Facebook ads. I spent, I think, 20 or $30 on Facebook ads. And Facebook showed the, I, I uploaded two of mine and two of hers. And it was Mary DeMuth who did the logos, a very talented graphic designer and author. And um, I ran the ads and sure enough, her logos beat my logos. <laughs> <laughs> so after 10, 000, tens of thousands of people saw the logos and more people clicked on hers than clicked on mine. I know scientifically that I am a worse graphic designer than Mary DeMuth. <laughs> the numbers are in uh, and the science is done. And this is not opinion. This is science. This is actual experimentation. And experimentation is so powerful. And so often um, marketing for books is not driven by science, it's driven by opinion. And it's driven by the wealthiest person's opinion, or what we call the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. Or if you're indie, it's driven by your opinion. And you're often far more confident of your abilities than you should be. <laughs> so um, a good professional is suspicious of their own uh, opinion. And I've learned to be suspicious of my own opinion, because it turns out I'm wrong quite a bit. And there's a way to find out what works and what doesn't. And the way to do that is to 
uh, experiment. And this is why measure, measure, measure is so important. Because if you're not measuring, you can't conduct experiments. Because if you don't know what your click-through rate is, if you don't know what your cost of customer acquisition, then you don't know um, which is working better. So you try ad copy for one ad and you try it for another ad. But if you don't have those numbers, if you're not measuring, how do you know what's the more effective approach? The author who's willing to learn this, who's willing to pull out their calculator to do a little math or to drop it into a spreadsheet will beat the author whose eyes are watering every time. Like this is fundamental. This is marketing 101. And you, here's the thing. You don't have to nece- you don't have to spend money necessarily to do this. If you just want to start dipping your toe in the water, we're assuming you have an email list at this point in time, you can segment your list. So you can send out one email to one part of your list and another email with a different headline. I actually um, have done this. I, a friend of mine said, all right, Jim, I, I want to have a little contest with you. I'm going to write one headline and you're going to write the other headline. And let's just see what which headline gets opened more often. And, and so we had that little contest and it was really fun to see, but it told him a lot about, okay, what type of headlines are garnering more interest, more response, higher open rates. And so you can actually do this with your, uh, your MailChimp email list. Yeah. MailChimp makes this very easy and convert kit uh, makes this very easy. It's called a split test or an AB test. And it is so educational. And if you've never done a split test before, uh, it's so it's it's like going to school and learning and it's very fun. And I used to do this uh, with every author media email for years was split tested. We still often do it. And I would write one headline and my employee, uh, one of my employees would write the other headline, whoever was creating the email that week. And we would see who would win. And you would think that because I'm the boss and I'm the man, my headline would outperform. And you know what? Sometimes it did. Sometimes I did write the better headline. But you know what? Sometimes it didn't. And I did not write the better headline. And But either way, both of us learned. So if the employee I was working with wrote the better headline that got more clicks, I would learn something. And if, if I wrote the one, she, she would learn something. And that is the beauty of experimentation. If you can put your ego aside, you can learn something. And with that learning builds on itself. So as you start to learn what words and phrases resonate with your audience, you can uh, build on that and get more and more effective uh, communication regarding your book. Okay. So Thomas, there's three fundamentals. We got one more. What is it? That's right. This is called the Matthew principle. You'll find it in business textbooks. And it's actually from the Bible, believe it or not. It's from a parable that Jesus gave uh, where there's these three uh, employees or three servants who are both given money to invest. One is given um, 10 talents, which is a form of money back in the day. One's given five and one's given one. And the guy with the 10 talents goes and invests it and gets back 10 more. The guy with five invests it and gets back five more. And the guy with one buries it in the ground and gets back zero. And the when they come before the boss, the boss says, take the money from the guy who had one and give it to the guy who has 10. And you're like, what? Why not give it to the guy who has five? Uh, and and the, the principle is to him who has more will be given and to him who does not have even what he thinks he has will be taken away. And as you're running ads, as you're buying keywords, which we haven't really gotten too much into keywords. So let's say you're doing search ads on Amazon, let's say, and let's say you're bidding on a hundred keywords, which is what I'd recommend at first, you know, get a hundred keywords related to your book, you know, buy all of the names of all the related authors, all the titles of all the related books, genre keywords, just tons and tons of keywords. And what you're going to find is that some of those keywords are going to perform really well. People are going to click on those keywords and they're going to buy your book and they have great conversion rates and great um, lifetime. All the metrics that we talked about are going to be really good. And other keywords are going to perform really badly. (laughs) And what you do is you take the money you were spending on those ineffective keywords and you boost your bids on the most effective keywords and you and you follow this principle and this principle is a fu- is a really great fundamental principle when it comes to um, effective advertising so effective in a lot of other areas of business but the idea is that you want to put your energy behind what's working the best uh, publishing companies do this um, they put their most money behind their most effective books you know their best books may be converting at 10 or 20 percent of visitors to the page go on and buy it and their worst books are converting it two or 3% of visitors to the page buy it. So if they're a savvy publishing company, they're going to put their money behind those effective uh, books because they're going to get a better return on investment, which is really unfortunate if you're the author <laughs> with a lower performing book because the publisher doesn't have an incentive uh, to spend money to promote your book if it's if the conversion rate on the page is lower. 
So I encourage you measure. So just to summarize, <laughs> summarize, have a good book, measure, 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 experiment until you learn what works and what doesn't, and then follow the Matthew principle to take money from the ineffective ads and put it towards your effective ads. These fundamentals will apply regardless of where you're advertising. Uh, even with outdoor, as long as you can measure, you can follow these principles. Uh, Jim, who's our featured patron? So our feature, you, you mentioned uh, Mary DeMuth doing your logo earlier, Thomas, and she is our featured patron this week. She has written a book called The Seven Deadly Friendships, How to Heal When Painful Relationships Eat Away at Your Joy. Uh, from her back cover copy, there's something wrong with your friendship, but you can't figure out why. Is everything in your head? Unfortunately, toxic friendships happen to everyone, but we seldom identify the underlying issues while we battle confusion or the friendship breaks up. Maybe you're left bewildered in the friendship's wake, paralyzed to move forward. After wading through several difficult relationships, Mary DeMuth reveals the seven different types of toxic relationships and empowers you to identify the messiest relationships causing you the greatest anguish. And since Mary is part of our mastermind group, we have been along, Thomas and I, in the development of this book. And I got to say, I cannot wait to read this book. It's going to be really good. If you're interested, um, the book releases on October 2nd, but you can pre-order it. And we'll have a link in the show notes where you can go and snag a copy, reserve a copy of that book. Uh, if you want to hear your book uh, mentioned on this uh, show, we've had our the level of at Patreon where you get your book mentioned has been sold out for the last couple of months. So we have several different levels. Not all the levels get you mentioned on the show. So if you're like, I don't want to be mentioned, that's okay. You actually spend less money. Uh, but we have a couple, as of recording, we have two open slots at the get your book featured on the show level. And so if you want to grab one of those before they go away again, go to novelmarketing.com and click the Patreon button. And we really do appreciate Mary and everyone else who helps make uh, the Novel Marketing Podcast possible. Yes. You have been listening to James L. Rubart and Thomas Umstead Jr. on the Novel Marketing Podcast, giving you novel ideas on how to promote yourself and your writing offline, online, and everywhere in between. Thanks for listening.